you all are a talkative bunch this morning, like you haven't seen each other for a week. That's great. Fellowship is wonderful. Welcome to First Baptist Church. We extend a special welcome to any visitors or guests that we might have with us today. If you are new to uh, joining us, we invite you to take a blue card that you'll find in the back of probably a chair in front of you or close to you. And we just invite you to fill that out and give us some information so that we would have a record of your visit with us today and get to know you better. Also a reminder, you're welcome to use the backside of that card, church, church family, anyone, to, uh, to let us know if there's anything that specifically you'd like us to be praying for, and uh, we would be glad to do that. Um, and so that's just a way for uh, you to communicate to us. And uh, let, me, uh, let me use this time also to remind you of a couple things that are happening today. And these will probably be mentioned again at the end of service. Uh, but, you know, I think they probably have done studies that say, you know, how many times does somebody have to hear something before they begin to know what's really happening in life? Well, unfortunately, that sometimes seems to be a lot of times. So, uh, so let, me, let me remind you of a few things. Uh, we, right after service this morning... Uh, we are going to have kind of our kickoff judgment house lunch and meeting. So if you filled out a form, you said, I want I want to help in judgment house. You might be a registration worker. You may be a prayer walker. You may be in the cast. You may be swinging a hammer and building a set. We want you to join us for lunch. We will have plenty of food. All right. So join us uh, for lunch in the gymnasium right after the conclusion of the service. Uh, after lunch, we will have a time of prayer. We'll go through the calendar. We'll talk about how am I serving. We'll, I'll, I'll go through the list of names so you know how you've been plugged in, our cast, and then we'll do a quick read-through of the script. And my goal would be to have you out of here on your way home by 2 o'clock, which gives you plenty of time for an afternoon nap, okay? Uh, and, and the Chiefs aren't playing today, so, you know, what's, what's left? <laughs> Um, so that's today, right after service. Then also a reminder this evening. This evening we are having a deacon ordination service for Scott Wilkinson and Chris Botts. And so we invite you to come back here in the sanctuary at 530. Uh, we invite ordained deacons to join us in M4 at 330. And we will do our questioning time uh, with those candidates. And then we'll be here 530, everyone invited and there will be a reception back in the gym afterwards that will follow, okay? So that's this evening. Then one last announcement, and this one, again, we've, we've tried to emphasize, but, you know, we are a busy church. We are a busy people. We've got a lot of stuff going on, and, uh, and so sometimes, uh, sometimes the best we can do is just try to keep you aware of, okay, this is what's, this is what's coming next. And so next, as far as in next weekend, we are having a prayer focus weekend. So this has been in your bulletin. It's been in your newsletter. We've tried to put things on Facebook. Um, and so what that means is beginning Saturday, actually, the ladies are having an event Saturday morning. Uh, the, the, the real group will be meeting at 9 o'clock. And so they'll kind of get the weekend started. And then at 1 o'clock, we turn our focus to prayer and so there's going to be activities through the afternoon, uh, which will take us to dinner. We will have a dinner here at the church. After dinner, we'll come in here, and we'll have a worship service and a time of prayer together. And that will take us to, then we'll finish here about 8.30 that evening, Saturday evening. We'll be back at 8.30 Sunday morning, and you're welcome to join us. We'll probably be over in the gym, and no, here in... Okay, all right, so we'll meet in the Welcome Center for some refreshments at 8.30, then we're going to have a prayer time before the 9.30 hour in here, then we go to Sunday school classes, I know all the adult classes are going to be with me in the gym, and I'll be meeting with Sunday school teachers tomorrow night, we'll be talking about that lesson and how they will be involved, uh, and, and so the focus on the lesson next Sunday morning is going to be on prayer, and then we come back in here for our 10.45 service which will again be a focus on prayer as well as an observance of the Lord's Supper, okay? So the prayer team who's planning this prayer retreat or prayer focus weekend, they need to know uh, as best they can how many are coming because they, they've got a booklet that you'll receive and, and so we don't want to make 100 copies and have 12 people show up, 
okay? Uh, we recognize there are some that need childcare. And so if, if, if that's what it takes for you to be able to come and participate as adults, we want to provide that, but we need to know that you're coming. Uh, we're going to provide a, a dinner that Saturday evening. It's going to be uh, kind of a baked potato bar with pulled pork, loaded baked potatoes. So we want to make sure that we have enough food for those that are coming, but we don't want to waste a bunch of food. All right? So that's why it's important for you to sign up. So I'm going to pass. did this a few weeks ago with our Serve Sunday, and it seemed to work pretty well. Uh, because, you know, there was no, well, I had to go by the bulletin board, and by the time service was over, I completely forgot. So I'm going to start this sign-up sheet over here, and this sign-up sheet needs to go through this section and to this section. I'm going to start this sign-up sheet here, and it needs to hit this area. This sign-up sheet is going to start here with Sam, and it's going to hit this area. And this sign-up sheet's going to start here, and it needs to hit this section and that section, okay? So that's next weekend, and again, Judgment House meeting, lunch, Join us uh, for, we'll have pizza and salad and, and, and things for lunch and our Judgment House meeting right after church, and then back this evening for our deacon ordination. All right, huh. let's worship. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning once again. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 and 29, it says this, have you not known... Have you not heard that the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. And so as we enter into this time of worship, let's stand together, and we're going to worship the everlasting God. Let's sing together.
everlasting God has given us a sure foundation for our lives. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, it says this, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in God's excellent word. Let's sing together. as Pastor Brian comes to pray with us. Would you all pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, we do thank you for this time that we could be here in your house, God, and that we could um, just fellowship with one another, Lord, and learn more about you, God. And uh, God, I pray that um, as we go through our time of worship today, Lord, that our hearts would just be focused on you, um, God, and that uh, we just might... Uh, just turn our hearts to you and just really focus on you today, God. God, I pray that um, this church, that we would um, reach this community, Lord, for your glory. Uh, God, I just pray again that you're with us through this service and that you would open our hearts to hear what you would have to say. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Brian. Pastor Brian comes up with a baby. I come up with a notebook. <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> It's not the same. As we take a look uh, at the Baptist faith and message today, it's worth remembering and thinking about the scope of what God has told us in his word, the Bible. God's word tells us about so many things, things that have happened in the past and in the present, and even things that are going to take place in the future. When we think about things um, in the past, think about like creation, Adam and Eve's sin, and the resulting fall, and 
even Jesus coming into this world, his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. All of these events took place in the past and are completed. God's word also tells us that God is at work in the present, still saving people from their sins by his grace and through faith, reconciling them to himself and still hearing and answering our prayers, still speaking through his word, which is living and active. But the Bible also describes events that are yet to come, like Jesus' second coming, the resurrection of the dead, and the final judgment. So this week, we are starting the next section of the Baptist Faith and Message, which is entitled, Last Things. As I mentioned a minute ago, uh, this section focuses on things like Jesus' second coming, and what will happen to those who've been made righteous by faith in Jesus Christ, and what will happen to those who remain unrighteous through unbelief when he returns. This study of the last things is often called eschatology, which comes from the Greek word eschatos, which means last, and ology, which means study of, hence eschatology, the study of last things. So this section begins with the sentence, God, in his own time and in his own way, will bring the world to its appropriate end. But before we dive into the meaning of this sentence, let me ask you this. Have you ever been riding with somebody who is driving and you really weren't sure if they knew where they were going? Yeah, oh, I heard some yeses out there. (laughs) Um, You had some expectation as to what the trip was going to look like, but the route that they are taking you on uh, doesn't look anything like what you were expecting. So you ask, uh, are you sure that this is the way that we're supposed to be going? And they're like, yes, I am positive. And you're maybe like, okay, because this does not look anything like what I was expecting. You take this turn and then that turn, and you're not really sure where they are going, but sure enough, eventually, at a point that you weren't expecting, you end up right where you're supposed to be. Despite the surprising route that you took to get there, the driver knew the entire time where you were going, where you were headed, how, it was, how you were going to get there, and then what time you were going to arrive. This kind of illustrates our sentence from the Baptist Faith and Message, which affirms at least three things. First, God will bring the world to its appropriate end. That's our destination. Second, he will do so in his own time. And third, he will do so in his own way. So let's think about each of these statements one at a time. First of all, God will bring the world to its appropriate end. And this is an end that he has determined. The Bible says that after Jesus comes again, after the final judgment, when all is said and done, John records in Revelation chapter 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. This is what God has promised, and it's our sure destination when we have trusted in Jesus, because he doesn't lie. Second, he will bring the world to its appropriate end in his own time, but that's a time that only God knows. Jesus makes this clear in numerous passages, but in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 and following, he explains that No one knows when he will return, but God the Father. And Matthew writes, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. And that's Jesus referring to himself as the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Jesus' words serve as both a clear explanation but also as a warning. Although we don't know when Jesus will return, we know that he will. And we should wait expectantly for that day. And then Jesus continues, Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have left his house, let his house be broken into. 
Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is cunning, coming at an hour that you do not expect. Thirdly, he will bring the world to its appropriate end in his own way. One of the principal events at the end of the world will be the second coming of Jesus. God's word tells us that he will come personally, visibly, and gloriously. Acts chapter 1, verse 9 and through 11 says, And when Jesus had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taking, taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. We see here in these verses that Jesus is taken up into heaven personally and visibly, and then we're told that he will return in similar fashion, personally and visibly. And he will also return gloriously. In, Phil in Thess um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, 17, and 18, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And I think that last verse is really important to remember. Encourage one another with these words. Although there are often many questions that arise from studying verses that describe the last things in Jesus' second coming, the details that are shared are meant to be an encouragement to believers. Just like that driver who seemed to be taking twists and turns to get to their destination, although this world often seems so chaotic and out of control, God is guiding it to its appropriate destination and end. God is certainly in control. And so our sentence for this week explains, God in his own time and in his own way will bring the world to its appropriate end. In the meantime, these are the days of the harvest. The fields are as white in the world. And we are the laborers in his vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he is coming soon. So why don't we stand together and we're going to sing Days of Elijah. Servant Moses, righteousness being 
Salvation comes from the Lord. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, it tells us this, that there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved, by the name of Jesus. Oh, what a Savior. Let's sing together. Jesus, we thank you for your presence here with, with us even this morning. We thank you that you have already demonstrated in the greatest way your great love and your, de and your death on the cross in our place. Every single one of us has sinned and fallen short of your glory. Thank you for demonstrating the love of God and that while we were still sinners, that you died in our place. Thank you for, again, your presence here this morning. We pray that as we have the opportunity to open your word and to hear your word preached, that as you speak to our hearts, that we would respond to you as Lord and Savior, King of our lives. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We remind our children, ages four through second grade, that you have children's church this morning, so... You are welcome to head toward the back door, and those kids will be upstairs. 
uh, for children's church, four-year-olds through second graders. Off you go. Everyone else, I encourage you to, uh, to use your bulletin this morning as uh, we continue in, in our series of messages through the book of Hebrews. And um, so I invite you, if you've not got your bulletin out, have that. Encourage you to make some notes. I may give you a little assignment to do a little bit later in our service this morning. As we, uh, as we sing together these songs on Sunday morning, uh, sometimes I'm just, I'm just in awe of how God puts things together. Now, Steve and I, our offices are right, ne right next door to each other, and, and we spend a lot of time in the office, but not necessarily talking about all the details of what's going to happen on Sunday morning between 1045 and 1215. But, but I, I, I become very aware that God has his hand on Steve as he selects songs, just as I pray that God has his hand on me as, as I open the scripture and I try to share with you the things that God has laid on my heart. And sometimes just to see how those things mesh together and, and how even this morning the teaching from the Baptist faith and message as we think about these last things, you know, the, the challenge that Christ gave, stay awake. Church, and I'm not talking just for the next 45 minutes. I mean, sometimes that may be a challenge just to stay awake. But even more importantly than that, church, we need to be awake. We need to see what is happening in this world around us because our Savior is coming back. And, and we, may, we may, be, may, may be satisfied to know that, well, I'm good. I'm ready. Come on, Jesus. Bring it. You know, let me see you. Part the sky. Let me hear the trumpet. Take me home. But the problem is we have a work that's not done. We are nowhere near being done. And that's why we do Judgment House. That's why we go on mission trip. That's why we do the things that we do because God's work is not finished. But he left us here. Hmm. Maybe that's part of his problem. He left me. He left you. He left us. We are imperfect. We struggle. We face challenges. And yet God has left us here for this season. I've been reminded of death this weekend. And it's, I'm, not, I'm not speaking of, of Aaron's wedding. Okay? This has nothing to do with that. Yes, Aaron and Jenny did get married yesterday, for those of you that were not here. Uh, you can watch it on Facebook. They streamed it, and they're off honeymooning for the next week. So blessings to them and safety to them. But before I came here at 3 o'clock to do their wedding, I was at the funeral home for a 2 o'clock funeral. I was reminded of death. This morning I got here at about 6.30, and I got a phone call from a nurse in the ICU, ICU unit here at Cameron Hospital asking if I would come pray with the family. I was reminded of death as I prayed with that family in one room. Somebody flatlined in the next room. And all of a sudden we heard cries for assistance, code blue. Our Savior is coming back. We are going to experience him, whether that be through our death or through his coming, through his second coming. And my prayer for us as a church is not only that we are ready, but that we are doing everything in our power to make sure that the people around us are ready. Students, you guys are going back to school this week. I know, that's kind of a bummer, maybe. But you know what? God is reopening a door to you to be on mission for him. At school, in sports, 
inactivities. Yeah, it's, it's one thing to come here to church and to hang out with our Christian friends. But it's a whole lot different to be walking that faith out in the real world. And we adults, we recognize that. You know, to live that in the business that I'm in. To live that out in the marketplace. To live that faith in my neighborhood. That is what the church needs to be. And that is what I just feel on my heart. That is, that is, that is the focus that needs to be the focus of our church over these next weeks and months and maybe even years is growing disciples. Growing disciples who will not drift from the word of God. Okay? Now, if you were here last week, you should have heard something about that. And if you were here and you've already forgotten what you heard, then stay awake. All right? Because we need to be attentive to what God is saying to us as his people. And yes, that hopefully happens in this hour. But it happens in a lot of other places in life as well. Most importantly, it happens through this book. So we are in Hebrews. This is the third week of, of a message that I entitled Much Better Than the Angels, but it's been looked at in three parts. So that's why your outline is headed Much Better Than the Angels, part three. And we're still referring to, to Hebrews chapter one. We began in verse four uh, three weeks ago, uh, two weeks ago. And, and, and now we're going to get into the end of Hebrews chapter 2 all the way through the conclusion of that chapter. But the main point, the main point of the message this morning is this. Jesus demonstrated his superiority to the angels in his divine person. Who Jesus was in his person, in his identity. He is, he was, he forever will be superior to the angels in his person, in his saving proclamation, his saving proclamation. That was the challenge that we heard last week, to, to hear the word, understand who Christ is as he revealed himself to us in the word and the fulfillment of his purpose of deliverance. Jesus came to deliver us. He came to deliver me. I was a sinner. I still am a sinner, but now I'm a forgiven sinner because I'm a repentant sinner. And I'm trying to turn away from that sin. I'm trying to let him be the Lord, the boss of my life. And it's for that purpose. He came to deliver us. So that we don't need to fear death. We have no fear. Because we know where we will spend eternity. So two weeks ago, we were looking in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 4 through 14. And we considered the first point, the first message in these three. The affirmation that Jesus is superior to the angels. So that was two weeks ago. I know, we've slept since then. But Jesus, he, he is superior to the angels. And that was a significant statement to the Jews because they, they, they recognized the work of these angelic beings, these messengers, these servants of God. They recognized their work. But, but the, the writer of Hebrews says Jesus is superior to the angels. Last week in our, in our study of Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, we received this point, admonition to heed the word of God and do not drift. We were challenged, heed, listen to, obey the word of God and do not drift from that word. At the end of that message, I challenged you with several things. Read the book. Read the word. Don't wait for the movie. Read the book. God gave it to us. We should be in the book. But more than reading, we need to study it. We need to spend time in it. We need to let it pour over our hearts. We need to meditate on it. We need to memorize it. Even we adults 
We need to let God's word penetrate our hearts so that it can shape and change our lives. We need to sit under teaching. We, we need to be students of the word. And that means allowing a teacher to teach us. And, and in many Baptist churches, we call that Sunday school. That's, that's where, one of the biggest teaching ministries of the church. And maybe you're comfortable and you're used to getting here at 1030 for 1045. I want to challenge you. Get here at 930. Be here for Sunday school. Be here at 915. All right, because a reminder, Sunday school starts at 930. All right, not, not at 945 or 10 o'clock or 1005, but at 930. And we need to be in a class. We need to be learning with other Christ followers because we can learn from each other. We can sharpen each other. We can encourage. We can pray. We can challenge each other. Sunday school is important. It is important. It's important enough that I should think about it even before Sunday morning. I should maybe use that book that they give me called a quarterly that we spend money on as a church so that people can take it and stick it in their Bible and never open it except on Sunday morning. No. That book is designed for you to take with you and to read, to become part of your study time, to become part of your prayer time, to become part of your reading and study and meditation and memorization time so you can come to church on Sunday morning and you can say, hey, I know what he's going to talk about today because I read the scripture. I read the quarterly. I have some thoughts. I have some questions. Sometimes we, we have none of those things. Because we're not ready. We show up. And we put all that responsibility on the teacher to give us what we need, even though we don't even know what we need. Because we've not thought about it. We come here on Sunday morning. We come in this room. And, and I know on most occasions, you, you, you survive this time. Everybody that walks in, usually they walk back out. But you know, how much, how much are we hearing? How much are we listening? How much are we paying attention to, not what I'm saying, but what God is saying to me? God, what do you want to say to me today? Because you know what? If God doesn't have anything to say to you today, you'd be better off just staying at home. But I believe he does have something he wants to say to you today. And you've taken a step of obedience by being here, by gathering together as God's people. You know, and some of us, we need to be challenged in that. This hour is the most important hour of my week. And that's not just because I'm the preacher. This is the most important hour and I recognize that there are conflicts and there are activities and things that are pulling us every which way. And sometimes I get mad that the organizers of those things don't understand that, that we, have, we have commitments at church. But I was convicted this week. I shouldn't get mad at, those, at the lost people for acting like lost people. I shouldn't get mad at them because they don't consider Sunday morning to be a sacred time where God's people should be in God's house. It's not their fault. But it's my fault if I let that dictate who I am. That's my fault. That's on me. And I will be accountable for that one day. What was really important in my life? What was the most important thing? And how does God factor into that? Now, ah, that was last week. This week, that was a bonus mini-sermon within the sermon. This week, we'll see the explanation that Jesus is not inferior due to his humanity. Jesus is not inferior. He's superior to the angels. And we are to heed his word, the word of God. But Jesus is not inferior due to his humanity. And through this, we're going we're to be in Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 5 
through 18. The fact that, that angels are divine messengers, ministering spirits, without human bodies would seem that they would have an advantage over Jesus, who had a human body while he walked and he ministered on this earth. But the writer of Hebrews offers four reasons that explain why our Lord's humanity was neither a handicap nor a mark of inferiority. And that's what you're going to see on your outline this morning. So we begin with the first, point A. Jesus' humanity enabled him to regain man's lost dominion. Jesus' humanity, the fact that he is human, was human, enabled him to regain mankind's lost dominion. And so for that, we look at Hebrews chapter 2, and I'm going to read verses 5 through 9. Hebrews 2, 5 through 9. I'm reading New American Standard. You follow in whatever translation you use. For he did not sub subject to angels the world to come, concerning which we are speaking, but one has testified somewhere, saying, What is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So in this passage, we see these things. Number one, dominion granted to mankind. Dominion was granted to mankind. And for that, we go back to the beginning of the book. We go to the Genesis account. We go to, to creation. God commanded man. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, God said, fill the earth and subdue it. And rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. While man was appointed to oversee the works of God's hands and all things were put in subjection to him. They were placed under his feet. And yet mankind forfeited that position of dominion, that position of authority, he forfeited. Our authority, our, our dominion was lost due to sin. That's the second point on your outline. Dominion lost due to sin. God gave mankind dominion. He gave him authority over every created being, but in one act... Man lost that authority. He lost that dominion. And it was because of sin. In Genesis 3, verses 23 and 24, it is written, Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. And then it continues, So he, God, drove man out. That perfect relationship between the creator and his creation in mankind. It was broken due to willful disobedience. Willful rebellion against their creator God. The end of verse 8 in Hebrews 2 says, But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. And that may be a reference to mankind. You know, now things are no longer in subjection to him. But 
we know as we think about eternity, as we think about what Christ will do when we, as the scripture was quoted, read this morning, as that new heaven and that new earth, we're going to have another chance. And this time, sin is not going to be in the picture. There's not going to be sin. There's not going to be suffering. There's not going to be death. And once again, man will be given dominion. At that time, we will again have all of creation subject to us. But our sin today, my sin today, cre creates a wall of separation between us and God. And often between us and other people. Sin destroys. But God is able to rebuild that which mankind tears down. Though dominion was temporarily lost due to sin, number three, dominion is regained through Jesus. Dominion is regained. It was given to us. It was lost but it can be regained through Christ. Verse 9 clarifies that though Jesus, who has been made for a little while lower than the angels, by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Jesus Christ tasted death for me, for my sin. He tasted death for you. For your sin. And he tasted death for that person that still has rejected his gift of salvation. He tasted death for everyone. Jesus, God's son, superior to the prophets, superior to the angels, became sin on our behalf so that we could be restored to a relationship of holiness. As Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21... He, meaning God, made him, meaning Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Personalize that. He made him, God made Jesus to be sin on my behalf. That I might become the righteousness of God in him. I can't, I can't, I can't do that on my own. You can't do that on your own. It's only because of God's Spirit empowering us and filling us that we can walk that kind of life, that we can live that life of righteousness. It was only through the sacrifice of the perfect Lamb that the dominion of mankind could be forever restored. If He had not become man, if He had not become man, Jesus could not have tasted death. But through Jesus Christ, number four, dominion is forever established. Dominion is forever established. Verse 9 of Hebrews chapter 2 says that Jesus was crowned with glory and honor. In Acts chapter 3, verse 13, Peter said in these words that he preached, the God of our fathers has glorified his servant, Jesus. Jesus is now glorified as he has sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, as it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Because Jesus came to earth as a man to may be made for a little while lower than the angels, he was exalted to the highest position of praise. And his dominion is forever. And our dominion with him as his church, as his children, will also be forever. So Jesus' humanity enabled him to regain man's lost dominion. But secondly, Jesus' humanity enabled him to bring many sons to glory. His humanity enabled him to bring many sons to glory. And for that, we turn to Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 10, reading through verse 13, where it says, For it was fitting for him... 
for whom all are all things and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. Jesus' humanity enables him to bring many sons to glory. Christ gave up his glory to become a man. And he regained that glory when he arose and ascended into heaven. And now he shares his glory with all who will trust in him for salvation. Four, number one on your outline, Jesus was perfected through suffering. Jesus was perfected through suffering. Now, do not misunderstand The writer of Hebrews is not insinuating that Jesus was imperfect. But in verse 10, to perfect means to be proven to be adequate, to be complete. Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9 states it this way, Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect... Having been proven to be perfect, to be complete, to be adequate, he became to all those who disobey him the source of eternal salvation. Jesus was perfected. He was proven to be adequate through his suffering. You know, that is a sign of our faith as well. How well do we endure the hardships? How do we face those challenges? How do we deal with suffering and temptation and and the trials of life? Do not dismiss the challenges, but see them as opportunities by which we can give glory and honor to God by the way that we face those challenges challenges, we too can be perfected even in our suffering. Secondly, mankind is sanctified according to Christ's example. Okay, we're going to focus on that word sanctified here in just a moment. And this is one of those words that I continue to just wrestle with, trying to understand it. it it's, just, it's just a churchy word. I just don't use that word in any other conversations other than in my faith. And so trying to understand what that means. But mankind is sanctified according to Christ's example. Verse 11 identifies that Jesus, he is the one who sanctifies and we are the sanctified. We have been made holy, consecrated, set apart, regarded as special. We have been set free from the guilt of sin. Sanctification. If we go to our Baptist faith and message, we see this definition. It says, sanctification is the experience beginning at regeneration. So that means when I asked Jesus into my heart, when I, when I got saved, When I became a Christian, so it is the experience beginning at regeneration, beginning at the point of my salvation by which the believer is set apart for God's purposes and is enabled to progress toward moral and spiritual maturity through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in him. Now, in one of the study Bibles that I use, the writer speaks of three different kinds of sanctification. And and, and to me, this kind of helps me understand the full full scope of what the word means. 
First, there is positional sanctification. I, I, I am sanctified because of my faith in Christ. Once I asked Christ to be my Savior, to be my Lord, He said, Terry, you are sanctified. You are now set apart for my purpose. Okay, that is a positional sanctification. But then he went on to explain experiential sanctification. The sanctification that we experience, that we live out day by day. In the Baptist faith and message, it talks about progressing toward moral and spiritual maturity. That is a continuing work. So I was sanctified from the point of my salvation, but I am continuing to be sanctified because I'm still growing up. I, I, I'm trying to not be a baby in Christ anymore. I'm trying to grow in the word so that I can accept the meat that he has to offer. And so it is, it is a, and it, it's, it's a progression of my faith. It's, it's an experiential sanctification. But then he concludes with the ultimate sanctification, that future sanctification, that time when Christ comes back and these old tents, these dwellings that we live in, the flesh and blood that we're in right now, it's gone. And, it's, and, and because it's gone, we no longer have the nature to sin. We will be sanctified forever. That is the ultimate future sanctification, but that does not happen on this side of life. Embrace the sanctification that is yours and progress, grow in spiritual maturity. We call that being a disciple. That's what we're here to do. Go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. You know, our call is not just to see people get saved. It is to grow people up in their faith, to help disciple. That is so significant. Thirdly, relationships within a spiritual family have been formed. Relationships within a spiritual family. I am so glad that I'm a part of the family of God. I'm so glad that I'm a part of this family of First Baptist Church in Cameron, Missouri. I am so glad that God placed me and my family here. You know, it, it, it is, there is something special about being in a family. We recognize that in, in, in our physical life. How blessed it is to, to know and, and to have a, a, a father and a mother, a sister and a brother, a wife and children and aunts and uncles and that family. Well, we have a spiritual family. Those of us who are sanctified. Jesus is not ashamed, the scripture says. He is not ashamed to call us brethren. He's not, a, he's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. As the Hebrew writer quotes passages from Psalms chapter 8 and Psalms 22, Jesus relates to us as brothers and sisters as well as children. He states in Matthew chapter 12, verse 50, For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven... He is my brother and my sister. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are brothers and sisters of Christ. What an awesome spiritual family relationship we have. Jesus' humanity allows him to bring many sons to glory. But third... C, on your outline, Jesus' humanity enabled him to disarm Satan and deliver us from death. To disarm Satan and to deliver us from death. Reading verses 14 through 16. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death 
he might rend powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Jesus did not come to save the angels. He came to save humans, mankind, me, and you. Number one on your outline, Jesus shared our flesh and blood. He shared our flesh and blood. Jesus, in his humanity, only then could he die. And through his death, eternal separation from God would be defeated. Verse 14a says, Since then the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, referring to Christ, capital he himself, likewise also partook of the same. He took our flesh, he took on our flesh, he took on blood. As written in John 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Son of God, the Son of God became the Son of Man. For then, secondly, Jesus disabled the enemy. Jesus disabled the enemy. Jesus became flesh and blood so that through death he might render powerless him who had the power over death. That is the devil. So in what sense did Satan have the power over death? Well, the final authority of death is in the hands of God. And, and Satan can only do that which is permitted by God. But because Satan is the author of sin, and sin brings death, in this sense, Satan has power in the realm of death. For his kingdom, Satan's kingdom, is one of darkness and death. We who have trusted Christ have been delivered from Satan's authority and from the fear of death. Jesus has given us the victory. He has given us the victory. He has disarmed the enemy through his own death, through his burial, and through his resurrection. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 57. And accordingly, number three, Jesus freed the captives. Jesus freed the captives. Verse 15 says that Jesus might deliver those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. That he might deliver. The word deliver in the Greek means to be released from, to be rid of. In a legal sense, the opponent has been appeased and the charge has been withdrawn. The Christian life is one of freedom, not slavery. Would you repeat that after me? The Christian life is one of freedom, not slavery. The Christian life is one of confidence, not fear. Would you repeat that after me? The Christian life is one of confidence, not fear. And the Christian life is one of power, not weakness. Repeat that after me. The Christian life is one of power, not weakness. Do we understand, church, that I am free, I am confident, and I am powerful, not because of me, but because of Jesus Christ, because he defeated the enemy. He disarmed the enemy. And then he freed his captives. Jesus, Jesus' humanity allowed him to disarm Satan and to deliver us from death. And lastly, D on your outline, Jesus' humanity enables him to be a sympathetic high priest to his people. His humanity allows him to be a sympathetic high priest to his people. Reading verses 17 and 18. Therefore, 
he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. So in this, we see four things. Number one, Jesus was made like his brethren. He was made like us. Jesus had to be made like us in all things. Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8 says that Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Jesus was made like his brethren. In his incarnation, Jesus accepted, the lim he accepted limitations to his deity, thereby allowing himself to experience life as a man made like his brothers. In this, number two, Jesus became a merciful and faithful high priest. He became a merciful and faithful high priest. To be merciful means to be compassionate, acting consistently within, within the revelation of God's covenant. To be faithful means to be reliable, to be trustworthy. The high priest must be a man. He had to be a partner in our human conditions. Jesus knew what it was like to be a helpless baby, a growing child, a maturing adolescent. He understood and knew the experiences of weariness and, and hunger and thirst he knew what it was like to be despised and rejected, to be lied about and falsely accused. He was tempted, and yet he did not sin. He experienced physical suffering and death. All of this was part of his training for his heavenly ministry as high priest. As our high priest... Jesus made the necessary sacrifice for our sins so that we might be reconciled. We might be made right with God. Verse 17 also says, number three, Jesus made propitiation for our sins. Now, there's a good Bible word. Propitiation. Got to think, think about that one. Propitiation, which means this to appease or to satisfy the divine wrath that is on sin. God's wrath is on sin. Understand the difference. When I accept what Jesus did for me on the cross, my sin is no longer my sin. My sin became Christ's sin. He bore that sin for me. And through his bearing that sin for me, Christ's wrath, God's wrath for sin is appeased. It is satisfied. Not because of me. Because of Christ. Paul makes it clear in Romans 3 that Jesus' sacrifice was fully sufficient. This passage begins very familiar. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But it continues. Being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. God's holy demands were satisfied through Christ. As it finishes with number four, Jesus comes to our aid. He comes to our aid. 
because Jesus was tempted as we are tempted, he is able to help us. The idea of aid carries an urgency as it means to come to the rescue of, to respond to an urgent need. Your translation may use the word succor, S-U-C-C-O-R, which literally means to run to the aid of a child, to bring help when it is needed. Angels are able to serve but they are not able to help us in our time of temptation. Only Christ can do that because Christ became a man. And in his humanity, he was enabled to become that sympathetic high priest. From a human perspective, it might seem really foolish that Jesus would become a man, that God would come to this earth in the form of mankind. And yet, it was this very act of grace that made possible our salvation. When Jesus Christ became man, he did not become inferior to the angels. For in his human body, he accomplished something that the angels could never accomplish. Salvation for mankind. Salvation for you and for me. Salvation for the lost in the community around us. Salvation for the people of Montana. Salvation for the nation of Malawi. God made salvation possible through the obedience of His Son, Jesus Christ. And at the same time, He has made it possible for us to to share in His eternal glory. Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. But are we ashamed to call him Savior and Lord? He's not not ashamed to call us family. My brothers, my sisters, my children. And yet, are we ashamed to call him Savior and Lord? And, you know, in our heads, we might know the answer that we want to give. Oh, no, I'm not ashamed to call him my Savior, my Lord. Okay. That's easy to say on Sunday morning at noon. But what about when you leave this place? How are you going to walk? How are you going to talk? What are you going to look at? What are you going to listen to? What voices are going to shape your life? With whom are you going to identify? Because it's outside of these walls where we begin to deny Him. Not here. It's safe here. It's easy here. Not so much out there. And that's why we need each other. That's why brothers need brothers. And sisters need sisters. Christ followers need Christ followers. We need each other. And we need to grow in our faith. Every one of us. Whether we have been a Christian for five months. Or whether we've been a Christian for 50 years. We must continue to grow. So Jesus demonstrated his superiority to the angels in his divine person, his saving proclamation, and the fulfillment of his purpose of deliverance. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer?